Welcome to another edition of Tales of the Workshop. Today, we're going to look at DC current. Today, we're going to take an in-depth look at the problems associated with switching DC current. I'm going to be using a general purpose relay as well as an IEC rated contactor. What we're going to do is examine up close what are the problems with switching DC current and the kind of pronounced arcing that's associated with it. What I am going to do as well is show you some of the tips and tricks that we could utilize to help offset or mitigate these problems. So come along on this journey as we take this in-depth look at switching DC current. What I've done is I've set this up so that my general purpose relay, the coil of this particular relay operates on 24 volts and I'm going to control the operation of my coil via this push button. So we've got power coming from the power supply to the push button, from the push button to the coil and to the coil back to the neutral. Now, what we are gonna be doing is we're gonna be switching 140 volts DC. So we're just gonna come into our common and then we're going to go to the normally open contact right down here. And so this lead is going to go up to our resistors. We have to, ha <clears throat> we have, to have a complete circuit in order to observe this phenomenon with switching. We're using 20 ohms of resistance to control the amount of current flow. Now, what is going to happen is that these relays use what we call a clapper contact. Now, the problem with these clapper contacts is that there's not an awful lot of air gap in between. And when the contacts go from the open position to the closed position, not much is gonna happen. But when we open up a circuit that is under load, what happens is that we're, we're trying to interrupt the flow of direct current. And that's where the problem is going to happen, is that the current never diminishes in its sine wave, unlike alternating current. So let's turn on the power and let's see what happens. We're gonna energize our power supply. And here we go. And we're gonna get a nice close up look at what's gonna happen. Now we can hear, here's the arcing. Now, unfortunately, I can't do anything to turn this off. That's how I was able to turn off the circuit was I energized the coil. I made the contacts or the, uh, the, the armature close again. And then once this was in the closed state, I turned off the power. But what it goes to show is that the current is literally jumping or arcing across the air gap that exists. And it's taking what we call a low impedance path. This is a problem. Left unchecked, what will happen is that the contact material is going to get pitted. When we have a pronounced arcing, we've also are going to see a little bit of heat. Well, actually a lot of heat and left unchecked, what can happen is that the contacts can actually either A, burn themselves out, or they can also weld themselves together. So for the longevity of the device, it's not ideal. What can we do to solve this problem? One, one way we can do this, right now we only have the one contact, but if we switched the type of device, meaning if I went to a contactor, contactors are specifically built for switching large amounts of current, normally associated with a motor. They use what we call bridge contacts, meaning that the contacts are broken in two places. Let's see if we, by substituting a clapper type contact for a bridge contact, what we're going to do is effectively double the air gap and we know that air is a natural insulator. 
it's going to be much harder for current to jump across an air gap if there is a progressively larger air gap. So I'm going to reset my workstation and I'll be right back. Now before I go ahead and put this into the circuit, I wanted to show my viewers that what I've done is I actually took a small tool and I've cut away a viewing port so we can actually see what is going to go on inside of the device when it's in operation. What we should be able to see is if I depress the armature is we should be able to see that there's a set of contacts that are going to open and close. Now I'm going to set my camera up to get a nice close-up shot but I felt it was important to let my viewers see how is this going to be organized. And what we can see is that there are two gaps and what we should also notice is that the air gap between the contact material is at least twice as wide as that of my relay but also that I've got two contact points and that's really important because if I put two contacts in series I'm effectively doubling the air gap in addition to the air gap that already exists between the contact material. I'm going to go ahead and set this up. So the first thing we want to do is we're going to use the exact same value of voltage and current so the resistance isn't going to change. The value of voltage that I'm going to put into the circuit isn't going to change. Now here the coil of this particular device operates on alternating current and so I have to bring this to a neutral on the power supply a2 and my A1 is going to go up to my push button. Now, as I said, I need to operate this on alternating current. Now, here's a fun fact. This particular device, because it was engineered to operate on alternating current, can in fact operate on direct current. The same cannot be said though for a device that was engineered to operate on direct current. It cannot work on alternating current because it doesn't have a shading coil. Now, let's put that relay up here and let's go ahead and we're going to energize our circuit and now we're going to observe what's going to happen inside of the window. Now, because this contactor is fairly light, I'm going to have to kind of hold it so it doesn't jump around on my box. So here goes. And let's see here. We energize it. Now, we can still see arcing, but what happens is that the amount of arcing has been greatly reduced. Arcing is not pronounced and it's not continuing to travel between the contact material. Yes, there is still a tangible arc, but it is not sustained. That is one technique that can be used effectively to help mitigate arcing. What we can do is lengthen the contact material. I did that by switching devices, but we could also put two contacts in series with one another, but you're going to have some limited success. One of the more effective methods of dealing with arcing that I know of is to use a capacitor. What I'm going to do is I want to go back to using the relay because of the fact it's really going to showcase how effective a capacitor is at helping to dissipate current that exists between the opening contacts. I'll be right back. I have just reset the workstation with the general purpose relay that has the clapper contacts. Again, I wanted to really showcase how effective this technique I'm going to use of using a capacitor in parallel with the contacts is at helping to eliminate the current. I'm going to demonstrate it and then I'm going to take you through some of the theory associated with it and why it is so effective. Now, I've got a set of leads with alligator clips and I'm going to put my alligator clip right across the common and here is a capacitor. Now this, I should mention, this capacitor is only one microfarad. It's not a lot but it is going to have a dramatic effect. And here is our second lead going to 
the other side of my capacitor. Now, nothing else has changed. The same amount of voltage is still being used. I'm going to try and set this up so that we can actually, my viewers can actually see something with all, all the wiring in the way. Same amount of voltage, same amount of resistance, the same amount of current is going to be flowing in the circuit. But now, let's see the difference. So let's pay attention to the contacts. As we close, look, the arcing is almost gone. So there you have it, proof positive that we have techniques that can help us eliminate arcing across contacts. Now why does adding a capacitor across a set of contacts is considered effective? Capacitors have what we call low ESR, equivalent series resistance. The capacitor is basically taking some of the current that would normally be traveling through the air and it's diverting it and it is actually using it to charge itself. Remember, electricity likes to take the path of least resistance. The capacitor has less internal resistance than the current having to jump through the air gap that exists between the opening contacts. I had mentioned previously that air is considered to be an insulator. Giving the current an alternate path, it's going to take the path of least resistance. And that's why it's really uh, effective as a technique to mitigate arcing. Now, let's take a look at a purpose-built DC contactor and how it was actually engineered to deal with arcing in the first place. Here we have a typical DC contactor over on my right. What we can see is at the top we have an arc chute. The arc chute is normally insulated with asbestos. Asbestos is heat resistant and when we have arcing, we're going to have an awful lot of heat. It is a byproduct of current flow. Also, down here, we have the auxiliary contacts. You'll notice that we have normally open as well as normally closed contacts. We're going to have to turn the device around so we can actually get a better look at the, the coil as well as the blowout coil. What I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the arc chute so we can have a better internal look. Also, we want to see the main contacts. Looking at this side of the contactor, we've removed the arc chute for better clarity. So what do we see? Well, we can see the main contacts. They utilize a clapper design. Why a clapper design? We want to make sure that we can get as wide of an air gap as possible understanding that an arc is basically current jumping across an air gap. The clapper contacts, because they operate on a pivot, we're going to get a more or less an opening and a smooth opening action that will gradually keep opening up, making it harder for the arc to sustain itself. But depending on the value of voltage that we're dealing with, it may require some advanced features that can be found on this type of contactor. The pieces of metal, the curved piece of metal that is in close contact with the main contactor or the movable contact, it's not there by accident. It is there to allow for the current to basically jump from the contact onto the metal to help stretch it out. But now how do we get that arc to move in a predictable pattern? Well, that's by using what we call the blowout coil. When current is traveling across an open air gap, we still have current flow. That current is flowing through the air gap across this metal piece and is flowing through this large conductor wire that is turned up into a coil. That is going to create a magnetic field of opposite polarity to the magnetic field or the, or the current flowing across the contacts. That's going to draw that arc in a predictable pattern up towards that blowout coil, stretching the arc, lengthening the arc to the point where it may not be able to sustain itself. 
That is the whole goal behind the design of this type of contactor. You'll notice that the coil is actually wound of a very large gauge conductor wire. It has to be of a similar gauge as the current reading of the contacts because that same amount of current flow has to go through that blowout coil. We can also see where it's connected underneath and how the blowout coil ends up on a T or the output terminal. Now let's talk about that braid. There's a braid down here. That braid because of the fact that we're utilizing a clapper type design, that pivots and we need to have a something in the design to allow for the current flow. That braid is basically a very finely braided wire, but it's laid flat to allow for years of use so it doesn't wear out and crack or fray. But the current actually is coming across that braided wire and to the movable contact. It's a very, very different design from that of a typical alternating current relay or contactor. Unlike most contactors, what's really unique about this type of contactor is that the input to the contactor is not on the top, but on the bottom. There's one of these large screws down here that uh, would be considered your L1 or your input for your power. And then the output or the T lead, commonly known in the trade, is located up there at the top right by the, uh, the blow up coil. Well, I really enjoyed today's presentation. I hope you enjoyed it as well and found it really informative. If you haven't already done so, please consider hitting like and subscribe to the channel. It really does help feed the YouTube algorithm and gets our message out there. Until next time, please stay safe and be careful out there.